Uh, yeah, maybe one minute more. Okay, so let's start. Um, so to begin with, uh, um, there is one student that told me that um, he's, uh, he, would, he wanted to record uh, these seminars and he's already recording the classes. And, um, and I, give, I gave my permission to do that with, uh, with the seminars too. So he's, he's putting all the all the videos on the uh, YouTube channel that uh, maybe I can share on the Canvas page or you can send out an email to everybody so you can uh, um, you can give a look to the the classes maybe when uh, when you're at home or I don't know um, of course uh, this um, I mean the point is that both in the notes uh, and in what I say, there might be mistakes, and uh, you should be aware of that because, uh, uh, yeah, okay, I'll post. Uh, ah, okay, so uh, under discussion, oh, that's good. Um, so you need to be aware that I might I might say wrong things and and write wrong things too because uh, I am essentially talking to myself for two hours and uh, I have literally no feedback from you, so which is uh, very helpful when doing classes to, uh, to tweak uh, and to, 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 help, uh, to help me to do correct things. So uh, just be aware of that. Otherwise, I think it's a good tool to, um, yeah, to, to see again what, what was done in classes. All right, so let's start with, uh, with the exercises for today. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, problems in chapter 12, uh, section one and section two, and then maybe a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit to the exercise sheet number one, if, if we have time. So I'll start immediately with exercise number five in section one. Let's see. So this will be um, first to give a little bit uh, a look about uh, domains of uh, functions in several variables and maybe a bit of plotting them. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then we will uh, compute a bit of limits, uh, which is very important. Uh, a very important topic, computing limits in several variables um, is quite tricky and we'll see why. So let's see, we want to, let me also uh, go to the correct page in the book. Uh, so we have this function here, f of x, y, square root of 4x squared plus 9y squared minus 36. And uh, we want specify we want to specify the domain of this function, so domain of, of f. So what is the domain of f? Of course, we have a square root, and then you know that the square root, what's under the square root must be greater or equal than zero. So the domain of f that I will indicate with df is the set of the points belonging to R2 such that uh, the argument of the root is greater or equal than zero. So 4x squared plus 9y uh, squared minus 36 is greater or equal than zero. Um, right. So what is this? Um, if we want to draw, if we want to sketch at this, uh, this set in a plane, you might, you might look at the equation. So 
sketch of df. So let's look at the expression with uh, without the uh, lesser equal, but with just the equality here. So we have this nine and this thirty six. So this gives us. Uh, we simplify by four, we get a nine here, and then we get uh, four here equal to one. So this is clearly an equation uh, of an ellipse. So you can see that, for instance, um, when uh, y is equal to zero, we get plus or minus three. So we get something like this. And when x is equal to zero, we get plus or minus two. So we have some ellipse like this. And then there is a greater or equal. So we are outside. Uh, so this set here is df. It's the domain outside this potato very asymmetric. But yeah. And there is a nice trick to find out whether, of course, when you have an inequality and you're not sure which part of the uh, of the domain you're you need to consider. So of course, I mean, this is a bi binary relation, right? So uh, an uh, a number can be either greater or equal than zero or strictly less than zero, right? So it's a, it's a partition of the plane. A, a relation gives you, like this gives you a partition of the plane. So you just pick a point. So for, for instance, the point zero, zero doesn't fulfill um, the expression that we have in DF. So it, it means that, uh, What's inside the, the ellipse uh, is not what we need to consider. So it's what we, we have outside. <coughs> Sorry. OK, so um, this is something easy. We go ahead with something easy too. Exercise number seven. Um, we have a function here with a logarithm. And still, we want to uh, determine the domain of this thing. OK, let's see. Um, the domain, of course, you, you know that uh, uh, the logarithm, the argument of the logarithm must be strictly greater than 0. So the domain of f is the set of the points x, comma y belonging to R2 such that um, 1 plus x, y strictly greater than 0, which is x, y. Uh, strictly greater than minus, minus one. So again, if we want to do a sketch of this set, uh, x, y. So x, x, y, x times y equal to minus one. It is an hyperbola like this, right? And then we want to see which part of the plane we have to consider. For example, if you pick the point zero, zero, you get that zero is strictly greater than minus one. So this is the portion of the plane that we consider. So this will be df. And so on. This is, uh, yeah. It is essentially uh, like in, in one variable analysis, I mean, you have to be careful to square roots, to denominators, to logarithms, uh, to tangents, and stuff like this, and then uh, and then just set the conditions as usual. But these conditions, these conditions will involve uh, more than one variable instead of just one, like in one variable analysis. So, okay, so let's see the number fourteen now. It's a size number fourteen. So size number 14, we would like to sketch the graph of the sum function. So we want to sketch the graph of f of x, y equal to 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And uh, there are some restrictions, restrictions also. So um, so f is restricted to uh, the set in which we have x greater or equal than 0, y greater or equal than 0, and 
x squared plus y squared less or equal than four. So this is our restriction. So it's not uh, uh, just f on the entire plane over the entire plane. It's just uh, it's just this. So let's try to sketch it. So what do we have? Uh, we have something like this. So we know already that we have to stay within the first octant. So we will have, yes. And then you can see that, um, I mean, the maximum of this function that, okay, I write it here. Otherwise I need to go back and forth continuously. Okay. So the maximum of this function is attained at x equal to zero and y equal to zero, right? And it is equal to four. So this is the max. So this is f of zero, zero is equal to four. And then, uh, I mean, um, okay, so we need to stay within uh, that uh, cylinder. So we will have something like this, I guess. So, yeah. And we have circles here. Um, wait. Okay, so yeah, it is. It has to be less so equal then. Mm, I'm confused now. Wait a second. Yeah, okay, yes. So, yeah, this is a very ugly picture, but we have to stay within uh, this limitation here. So x squared plus y squared has to be le less or equal than 4. So the maximum that we can uh, actually should go a little bit. Uh, no, I mean, this picture is not precise. I think I should go... Uh, I should go a little bit more down here. Uh, this is supposed to be a, like this, I think. Yes, because uh, on on that circle we have um, that the function is equal to zero. Right. Um, yeah, I think this is, yeah, I, this picture is not quite good. It should be something like that. It should be some sort of paraboloid with a, with a, with a maximum at zero, zero, and then, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's see. Let's see the number 23. Okay, so in this, uh, in this uh, chunk of exercises, we want to, to compute the uh, level curves of these functions. So we have this function here, uh, x minus y divided by x plus y. And we want to compute uh, the level curves The level curves of f. Compute the level curves of f. So yeah. Let's see. So level curves are computed by setting uh, by setting f of x y equal to k for k. A real number, so we need to solve this equal to k. Um, right, and uh, of course here we need to assume that x is not equal to minus y, otherwise we have, okay, we are actually outside the domain of this function, so we can assume safely this thing. So we multiply both sides uh, for x plus y and we get this. And if we shuffle around, we get y is equal to um, 
1 minus k divided by k plus 1 times x. So these are straight lines, right, passing through the origin. And uh, depending on the value of k, we will have different angles. So for instance, I can uh, draw some of them. So for k equal to 0, we have x equal to y. Yes, for k equal to 0. For k equal to minus 1, we get this y-axis. Uh, maybe it should be consistent with the notation. So this is y. Uh, x equal to 0 for k equal to minus 1. And then for k equal to 2, you will get something like this. Uh, what, what what is the let me check k equal to two this will be um, minus one third right so we'll get y equal to minus x divided by three for k equal to two and so on we can you might want to yeah for k equal to two three you get uh, minus one half. Yes, so these are the, the level curves. Okay, uh, similarly in the number 24, we want to compute the level curves of this function here y divided by x squared plus y squared uh, level curves. The level curves again are computed by setting f of xy equal to k for k being a real number. So what do we get? We get y divided by x squared plus y squared equal to k, which implies that y is equal to k times x squared plus y squared. Um, okay, so let me see if you if you do a little bit of reshuffling here, uh, you get x squared plus y squared minus y divided by k equal to zero, and uh, assume that uh, k is not equal to zero, otherwise. I mean, otherwise you get a degenerate um, level curve in some sense, because you get just a straight line, you get y equal to zero. Okay, so maybe I will speci specify that later. Uh, what is this? This is clearly a circle, but uh, how do we get the, the right equation? So yeah, um, let me just cut this so I have space to fit the equation. I don't write underneath this guy. Okay. I put it here. Yeah, so we have x squared plus y minus 1 divided by 2k to the power of 2 is equal to 1 divided by 4k squared. I just completed the squares, so now we have uh, we have the circles. So let's see. Um, so for k equal to zero, we have y equal to zero. For k different from zero, we get, let me see. Okay, so we get x squared plus y minus one divided by two k squared is equal to one uh, like this. Uh, and they are circles. So let's do a picture of these guys. So for instance, for, um, yeah, they are uh, kind of, well, almost concentric. Yeah, no, they are not concentric actually. So um, the centers of these, these circles are lying on the y axis, right? So for k equal to two, um, Maybe for k equal to 
one half, we get uh, that uh, the center is here at the um, at zero one, right? Uh, okay, for k equal to one half, then what's the radius? Then we're on fourth. It simplifies so radius one. So the circle is something like this. And if we if we take the k equal to one, for instance, so this will be k equal to two. No, two one half. If we take k equal to one, we get uh, the center is here at zero one half, and the radius is uh, one half again. So we have this smaller circle, k equal to one. Yeah, and so on. You can do uh, that yourself. You have a family of circles. In there. So these are uh, the level curves of this. And we look at the last one of this. Uh, Excuse side. me, can I, can I ask? Yes, sure. Uh, regarding the previous exercise, uh, 23. Yes. Uh, what if we get the level curve y equals minus x? That is. Uh, in the domain is that included or or not uh we get x equal to we uh, sorry we we didn't get the level curve x equal to minus y because uh x equal to minus y doesn't belong to the domain of the function so we are actually outside uh okay so the domain we cannot get that one no. how about like uh, the um, uh, origin do we get that? No, uh, well, that's uh, no, we don't. Mm, I don't think we get it. Uh, I mean, the origin doesn't belong to the domain of this function, but uh, it might be that um, this function can actually be extended by continuity at, uh, at the origin, but this is uh, not clear. One has to compute the limit. I don't think this is true. Uh, but I don't think we get the origin either. So I think uh, all the entire line is excluded. Um, <clears throat> to see if the, I mean, this uh, the domain of f doesn't include the origin, but uh, one can always compute. Uh, and I will I will say that just uh, after this last exercise, one can always compute this limit that I'm writing here and try to figure out if this limit exists or, or, or not, right? If it doesn't exist, then the function cannot even be extended by continuity at the origin. While if this limit exists, you can define another function, which you can call f tilde, that is equal to f uh, um, for x different from 0 and y different from 0. And uh, let me see. And uh, equal to l at zero zero so this function in some sense it can be confused with the, with the original function f because uh, because the limit exists so you confuse the two things but this is something this is a little bit uh, subtle thing so we will see examples when we compute limits limits i i don't think the, in this case the, the origin will belong to even to the domain of the extension so yeah okay thank you Right, you're welcome. I'll, I'll erase this because uh, we'll see in, in, in a short while what I mean with this. Okay, so okay, so what about the, the exercise forty? We have now a function which is of three variables. Um, so this function here, um, say it is squared. And uh, okay, so okay, so in this case we don't talk about level curves anymore. We we talk about level surface surfaces, and uh, if we have more than three variables, we will talk about either hypersurfaces or manifolds. Um, so level manifolds or or, or level hypersurfaces. So level level surfaces. So of course the domain of f is equal to z different from zero, right? We can't divide by zero. Uh, level surfaces are obtained as in the same way. 
we set equal to k for k being a real number. So I'll simplify already something here, we get k times z squared. Um, all right, so what do we get here? So we have to be, we have, we have to do a little bit of distinction. So we have three cases, so cases. So case number one, if k is strictly less than zero, then the level surfaces are just empty sets, right? Because uh, on the right hand side, you get a negative number while on the left hand side, you have a positive number. This can, can, can't happen. So um, level surfaces. are empty set. In the case in which k is equal to zero, uh, level surfaces, a level surface is equal to a point, the point zero, zero. Uh, no, actually no, and not zero, zero, sorry, uh, it's zero, zero, z, so z is, is free. Right? Um, so it's a plane. While the case number three, if k is strictly greater than zero, then we have a, uh, I mean, this, uh, this, is an this is an equation of cones, like we have seen the, the, in the previous seminar. So these are infinite cones. And if you don't remember that this is an equation of cones, you can either do a little bit of uh, uh, quantitative analysis, like I did uh, myself last time, or you just go to page uh, 596 of your book, uh, edition 8, and you look at the, uh, the list of the equation, and you will see that these are cones. So, yeah. So we found the level surfaces of this, uh, this function. Okay, so this is um, something preliminary about functions. And now we will go a little bit deeper into the analysis of, uh, of the behavior of functions, right? So what happens to a function when, when, you, when we have denominators and uh, we will learn how to compute limits. So the next uh, hour, I would say, I think, it will be dedicated to computation of limits in several variables and uh, to clarify this notion of extension by continuity that I was uh, talking about right uh, before when uh, this question. So, okay, so first of all, let's see, we want to compute the limit for x, y that goes to zero, zero of the function x squared plus y squared divided by y. Okay, so, all right, so uh, a common technique to attack these kind of problems is uh, to use um, um, polar coordinates, right? So we have seen polar coordinates in the first seminar. What are polar coordinates? You parameterize your plane using uh, angles and radices. And uh, um, it's very common to try to, to compute limits uh, uh, using polar coordinates because sometimes they simplify the expression. But uh, so we can try. Um, so usually, okay, not usually, but one possibility is to use polar coordinates. So I recall that polar coordinates are just x equal to r cosine theta and y is equal to r sine theta. And then we pick r being strictly greater than zero and theta being between zero and two pi, actually greater or equal. Um, yes, so if you do this change of variables and then you just take this guy here that I can call f of x because this is a function. So f of x, y can be written as f of r cosine theta, r sine theta. So you do this change of variable, you substitution, 
then you get r squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta divided by r sine theta. So at the, the, at the numerator, you see that uh, you get just r squared and the numerator you get r sine theta and then they simplify and then you get r divided by sine theta. Okay, so this, this expression actually uh, doesn't really help because one at this point would like, since x and y goes to zero, one would like to, uh, one would like to, to send r to zero, right? Uh, but, but, but this expression r divided by sine theta is not clear what happens because the theta now is free, right? It might be very, very close to zero. It might move uh, with r. Uh, and this expression, I mean, at, at, at the first sight, you might see, say, well, yeah, this goes, goes to zero, right? Because uh, r goes to zero and, and then we have sine theta. But the problem is that... Uh, uh, the angle theta might changes might change depending on, for example, which path you follow uh, to go to zero. So it might actually theta might go to zero too, and then you you create a singularity, and that's not okay. So in this case, uh, polar coordinates simply do not work. So polar coordinates do not work here. Mm. work here uh, in general in general to use for coordinates we need to get an expression expression in R only, or an exp an expression. Uh, I'm not right today. Expression that can be controlled, bounded above by R by some g of r, let's say this. And uh, polar coordinates uh, are used in general when this, um, these conditions uh, occur, in general, the limit exists. So when you have a control, a uniform control in theta, then you just take the limit and you see that this goes to zero. But in this case, so to solve to go to this specific exercise, we see, I mean, I want to claim that actually the limit does not exist in our case. So the claim uh, that limit does not exist. Why? Um, because uh, you can, for instance, see that um, uh, consider the curve phi one defined by t that goes in t t, so it's just a straight line, right? So if you do the composition between f and phi one, you get sorry, this is just a function in one variable. So what do we get here? You get t squared plus t squared divided by t. So you do the simplification and then you get two times t, right? And then if you take the limit for t that goes to zero of f of phi one t, that's going to be equal to zero. So it means that the limit along one straight line of this function is equal to zero. But if you consider instead uh, now the curve, take now the curve phi two t that goes into the square root of t t, right? That's a different one, that's a square root. So take again the composition here. 
what do we get? We get t plus t squared divided by t. And then you do, you just divide by t, you get one plus t. So now uh, the limit for t that goes to zero of one plus t, that's equal to one. So the conclusion is that we have two different curves along which the limits are different, right? So along the one straight line, we have zero. Along uh, this, uh, this uh, square root, we have, we have one. So this limit can't exist because uh, if, if a limit exists, it must be unique. It can't be different along two different paths. So conclusion. Conclusion. The limit does not exist. Yes, so, okay, so I would like to stop for a couple of minutes here. I see there is a question. Could you reiterate your point on using polar coordinates? Uh, yes, okay, so what I mean, I, we will see examples, and this is actually um, something that students usually uh, do wrong also in the examination, so it's important that you get it correctly. So in general, polar coordinates are used uh, to prove that a limit exists, right? Because, uh, so let me do an example. We'll see, we will see examples, but, but let me do an example. So very, very, very simple example here. We take some function f of x, y equal to this thing here. Actually, no, let me make it a little bit more hard. So we just have x squared. So we have a function that does not depend on y, but we don't care. So we want to compute uh, this limit for x, y that goes to 0, 0 of f of x. And let's suppose that, I don't know, for some reasons, we, we don't see that the expression is that easy. And we want to use polar coordinates to, pro to prove that, uh, that this limit exists, right? So if we use polar coordinates, we get that this limit turns into uh, a radius that goes to zero plus of what? We do this change of variables and we get r squared and then we have cosine squared, right? Okay, so here we are in, we are in a situation which is similar to the previous one, but not really because uh, now this uh, cosine that depends on theta uh, lie you know, at, at the, 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 the um, at the numerator, right? So this limit actually exists and it is equal to zero because this function here is bounded by one, right? So no matter what's the value of theta, it might even change. It might be, theta might even be a function of r uh, because so when you're taking, um, when you're using polar coordinates and you say that uh, your radius is uh, going to zero, so you're taking circles and then you're saying that uh, you're going you're, you're shrinking um, around the origin, but you might shrink, uh, for example, along this curve here, you shrink, and then you see that this angle theta gets very, very small. Uh, or maybe you might go in this direction like this, and then your theta changes a little bit. But in this case, in this specific example that I did here, it doesn't really matter with, uh, what the theta does because uh, we are at the numerator and uh, the, the function cosine squared is bounded by one. So we have a, a bounded function times something that goes to zero. So the limit will go to zero. But a different thing is if you have r divided by sine theta or cos theta. So in, in that case, you might, uh, you might follow a path like this I was doing before, very, very close to the x-axis, right? And this angle theta might might go to zero quite fast, uh, because in in some sense this theta is a, it might be also a function of r, because it depends on uh, which path you are following. So so you can't really conclude that this thing in red here goes to zero because the theta you you don't have control on theta, you don't know what theta does and. Uh, 
and you would like to. So in the first case, you can control um, you can control everything just by I mean simple argument. You can say that r squared cos this is less or equal than r squared, for instance, and then you and this goes to zero. So the whole thing goes to zero, and the go whole thing goes to zero. Um, in a way which is uniform with respect to theta. You can see that theta might be anything, might be even a function of r. We don't, we don't care because the, the control is uniform on, in theta. So, so we are done, we are fine. So this is the, the essence in some sense of the polar coordinates. You are safe to use them as long as you can control your expression in a uniform way with respect to theta. So if you can't do that, it's a, it's a, it's something that makes you. I mean, you should if some something like this red thing happens, you might start stop and think what what is going on there. Can I continue? Can I find a uniform upper bound? And the the, the answer is no in this case. So you might go back and uh, you need to go back and think more. Um, if the limit the limit might still might still exist, but the polar coordinates are just not the way to go. So, okay, I'll I'll erase this because, okay, it will be in the the recorded. Uh, do you is it a little bit clearer? Uh, do you have other questions on this? It's an important point. So if you have questions, that's a good moment to ask them. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me do. Let me go ahead, man. Um, we have number five. This number five. We want to compute uh, the limit for x, y that goes to one comma pi, right, of cosine of x, y, divided by one minus x minus cosine of y. Okay, so in this case, we actually don't have problems at that point, right, because, uh, so if you go close to the point one pi, at the numerator, we get uh, the function is well defined, and is not equal to well at the numerator there's never a problem but the denominator uh, close to that point is actually positive right because uh, if you just set x equal to one you get one minus one minus the cosine of pi which is minus one so this is uh, this limit actually exists you don't need to resort to any kind of uh, tricks uh, and this is just equal to minus one divided by one and this is just minus one. So this function is continuous there, so uh, the limit of course exists and then uh, coincides with the value of the function at that point. Let's see the number seven. Number seven. So again, we want to compute the limit for x, y that go to zero, zero of uh, y to the power of three. Divided by x squared plus y squared. Okay, so for instance, this is a this is a this is a good um, exercise. This is a good example in which uh, uh, you can see the power of polar coordinates. Because if you just uh, try to to figure out what's the limit by using Cartesian coordinates, uh, it might be hard here to uh, to get to get the value, but if you do polar coordinates here, what happens? You just have not not a row. Sometimes I might write rho instead of r, but they are the same things. So you get sine to the power of three divided uh, theta, and then here you have just r to the power of two. And this simplifies this power. I lost the limit, but the limit is here. R plus or r, 
no, uh, zero plus. And this is clearly equal to zero because uh, we have again a bounded function, which is a, a, a sine to the power of three of theta times a function that is, uh, is infinitesimal, right? So the limit must be zero. So in this case, you see that the limit exists. And uh, if you want to, if you want, you can see that uh, r sine to the power of three is clearly less or equal than r. So you have your uniform bound and this goes to zero. Uh, you are controlling your expression in a uniform way with respect to theta. Uh, theta doesn't appear in the bound, so. Okay. Let's do, okay, it's 11 o'clock. So we can uh, stop here and we'll, uh, We'll start uh, again uh, from exercise number nine after the break. Yeah, so if you have questions, I'm here. Or just type them and, uh, and try to answer. A question. Yes. Uh, when working in polar coordinates, you talk about controlling theta. Yes. What precisely do you mean by that? Well, I'm not controlling theta. I'm saying more controlling the expression where theta appears. Um, the polar co in the polar coordinates, as I said before, they are they are used to prove that something exists uh, and this something i mean controlling mean that you need to be able to uh, to find an upper bound which is independent on theta that that that, that what, this is what it means it must only depend on r so in this way uh, well, well not on r because i mean uh, th this ex th what i said is not completely correct because uh, you might find an upper bound that depends only on R, but maybe the upper bound is something like one divided by R. And in that case, this doesn't really give any information uh, because one divided by R goes to plus infinity. So you need something, you need to control your expression uh, with a function of R only, and that function must go to zero. In that case, you, you have existence uh, of the limit. Let me add this uh, here. Uh, gr goes to zero as r goes to zero plus. Uh, yeah. Is it uh, a bit clearer? Yes, thank you. You're welcome.
Thanks. Okay, uh, let's continue here. Um, we were on exercise size number nine. Are there questions? No? If you have questions, just talk to me. Okay, so if you don't have questions, I'll go ahead. I continue. So again, we want to compute the limit for x, y and go to zero, zero of sine of x, y divided by x squared plus y squared. Okay, so for example, this is an example in which uh, polar coordinates does, does do not really help because you have a sign and then you would like to you to, to use polar coordinates, but then you have you find yourself with something like sine of r squared times cos of theta sine of theta. It's very messy, so they don't really help. And um, and still uh, uh, close to the origin, the sign. I mean. For, for x equal to zero equal and y equal to zero, you have that sine is actually equal to zero. So this um, this quotient might, I mean, the limit might exist because we have zero divided by zero. So at least it doesn't blow up uh, at first sight, at least. Um, so yeah. So my suggestion to attack, because because I know that some, sometimes you would like to have some sort of recipe to attack this kind of problem. So um, you have to do a little bit of inspection and see what, what, what happens. Um, so in this case, uh, as I said, uh, you just discard the polar coordinates because um, it, 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 they just complicate the thing. So um, yeah, you have to try to, 
to figure out what, what happened. So one way to solve this problem would be um, to remember that uh, so for for x y close to zero zero um, we have that um, sine of x y is approximately you can approximate the sine with a x y right you remember the one variable limit in which we had that lim for x that goes to zero of sine of x divided by x is equal to one. So you can approximate a sine with x, and the, by the same principle, if the argument is xy, you just take uh, you approximate it with xy. So this is uh, this is one possibility. So in that in that sense, you might want to change the limit and compute uh, lim. Uh, for x y that goes to zero zero of x y divided by x squared plus y squared instead. So that's a possibility. Okay, okay. You you have actually all terms of uh, uh, you have something like this x y to the power of three. Uh, so yeah, you have to be a bit careful, but they should be negligible in the end. Um, So this is uh, left for you as an exercise because I didn't want to, to do this solution. My solution is simply, well, a possibility that you have to try different curves, to try different uh, straight lines like I did before and to, and to see what happens. So in this case, it's very easy because um, you try the first two straight lines that you, you can think about, uh, they are uh, the ones that will give you some sort of answer because uh, so, um, take uh, the curve phi uh, one for t that goes into zero t, and then you do okay. So let me call this guy f of x y um, f of phi of t. That's equal to zero divided by t squared so it's actually equal to zero so along this line the function is constant and it is constantly equal to zero and then you can take another curve phi2 that i took to be t that goes into tt now this is a straight line x equal to y so you have that phi sorry f of phi2 of t this is equal to sine of t squared divided by two times t squared. All right. So now the limit for t that goes to zero of sine of t squared divided by two times t squared, that's equal to one half for the same reason, because you can approximate the sine of t squared with t squared when t is small. So the conclusion is that the limit does not exist. The limit does not exist. And that's because the limit is different along two different paths. For the existence, you would need uh, the same limit along with all possible paths. Yes. OK. So let's see. Let's see the number 10. Okay, so number 10, we have the limit for x, y that goes to 1, 2 of this function here. Okay, so this is one of these cases in which uh, you see that um, uh, yeah, I mean, you see that uh, if you just stick one, two in the denominator, you get uh, you get four minus four, so you get zero. So this point does not belong to to the domain of this function.
Yes, I'll... Okay, so, okay, let me go back to the previous page and to answer the, this question of Zoe. How do we know which path to, to choose? We don't know. We don't know. So, um, if there are exponents, um, or if you have like polynomials or things like that, it should be quite clear, or at least uh, if you investigate a little bit, it should be quite clear uh, if there is like a dominant term that might, you know, uh, lead your function to some value or to some other value. But uh, a priori, you don't know that. I mean, uh, that's why these kind of limits are a bit tricky because uh, you don't know which path you have to use. Um, and indeed, I wanted to, uh, when I'm done with these exercises, I want to leave an exercise for you that I cooked up myself, exactly to, to show this concept that you can try uh, simple paths and they won't work, but still the limit does not exist because uh, there, there, there are two paths uh, along which uh, the limits are different, but they are hard to find, so it's a bit tricky. Okay, so what about this? So this is one of these limits uh, I, was, I was saying. That, okay, so this point doesn't belong to the domain of this function. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you can see that, uh, um, so this is one example of these removable singularities, right? Because if you collect an X at the numerator, uh, what do we get? We get this, and then on the denominator, you see that that's a difference of squares. So you can actually write, uh, it like this. So these two guys, they simplify, right? So we still have that this is the limit of x, y that goes to 1, 1, 1, 2, and this of x divided by 2x plus y, and this is going to be equal to 1 divided by 4. So in this case, the limit exists. So while the function is not defined at 1, 2, the limit still exists, right? So this means that I mean, uh, you can extend your function by uh, continuity at the point 1, 2, and the value of that function will be on 1 divided by 4. Um, yes. So it's like, um, yeah, I mean, it's like the one variable case in which you have this uh, removable singularity. So for example, if you have the function x divided by x, uh, Strictly speaking, this function is not defined at zero because you would have a nonsense expression, zero divided by zero. Nonetheless, so you can ex extend this function such that its value at zero, it is equal to one, which is the natural. Uh, so you get a continuous extension of this function. And this uh, principle applies here uh, also in, in this uh, two variable or several variables cases. So. Okay, so let's see the number 12. So in this case, we have limit for x comma y that goes to zero, zero of x squared uh, y squared divided by two x to the power of four plus y to the power of four. Okay, so if I call again this function f of x, y. Uh, okay, so what happens? Uh, so, okay, so instead of defining if phi one, phi two, I can just write, okay. So, well, okay, let, let me be consistent. I will take phi one to be the map that sends t into zero t. And in that case, um, I have that f of phi one of t is equal to zero, right? Yes. Uh, it's equal to zero for all t. Yeah. Phi two is the map that sends t into t t, and this is telling me that f of phi two is equal to um, t to the power of four divided by two t to the power of four plus t to the power of four. So we get, uh, we get one third, right? So again, 
this is uh, the conclusion is that the limit does not exist because we have two different limits along two different curves. So conclusion, uh, the limit does not exist. Exist. Okay, so let me show this example. I think this is uh, this is not in the book. So, but I think it's a um, it's a nice example to show. Let's uh, let's compute this. Uh, not in the book. Um, so take for ist for instance, uh, you want to compute. Uh, uh, the limit for x comma y that goes to zero zero of the function x y to the power of five divided by x to the power of three plus y to the power of eight, right? This is so now, yes, I'll show you the last page here. Just let me know when I can move. Is it okay? Can I go ahead? Okay. So this is actually, I think it's a good example because if you try, um, if you try those simple curves that um, I tried so far, so for instance, take this and this is equal to zero, right? And then I want to try t t instead. And this is giving me uh, t to the power of six uh, divided by t to the power of three plus t to the power of eight, right? Um, you can see that here the leading term is t to the power of three, the denominator, so we get this. So you simplify and you get three, and this still goes to zero for t equal to zero. So this doesn't work either. And then I try, well, I say, let's try with this instead. t to the power of 2 comma t. OK, I'll go in and I try to see if this is enough. OK, what do I have? t to the power of 7. Uh, t to the power of 7 divided by t to the power of 6, 1 plus t to the power of 2. Simplification, and this still goes to 0 for t that goes to zero. Well, one might think, well, man, this limit must exist. I go ahead and try another curve, another parabola here. What do I get here? t to the 11, and then I have 2 to the t to the 3 plus t to the 16. Again, 2 to the 11, to the 3, 1 plus, and then here we have t to the 13. Simplification, we get uh, 8 here. And this goes to zero for t that goes to zero again. So we found another one. So we found actually five different curves along which we have zero as a uh, we have zero as a limit, but the limit still does not exist. Let's try this curve instead. So I hope this is going to work. T comma t to the power of one divided by five. So what, what, what do we get here? So we get at the numerator, we have t times t, right? And then here we have t to the power of 3 plus uh, t to the power of 8 divided by, by 5. OK, so maybe I missed, actually. Um, no, this limit is going to be, to, be, to be zero still. OK. Mm. OK, never mind. So I fucked up. I think that's not a good example to show you. Because this limit is still going to be zero. I thought I had a good example, but I don't. So 
Well, whatever. Uh, this is uh, the problem with the live shows. This is not okay. This limit might still not exist, but this uh, curve uh, t comma t to the power of one divided by five is not really a counterexample because we have t to the power of two at the, the, the numerator and t to the power of eight divided by five at the denominator. So the leading term is, I mean, it's still going to zero. I'll think about that maybe in the um, uh, for, for the next time. So just forget about this for now. Still, you can you can cook up examples like this in which you try simple curves and, and they don't work, but in the end, the limit still do, do not exist. Uh, okay. Um, let me go back to problems uh, in the book. Okay, let's see the number 14. What's the number 14? Um, number 14. Um, okay, so the question here is slightly different. It has to do with the computation of limits still, but uh, it's rephrased a bit. So the question is now, how can the function, um, how can the function f of x, y, defined by this formula here, x to the power of 3 minus y to the power of 3, divided by x minus y, how can this function be defined along the line x equal to y so that the resulting function is continuous on the whole xy plane. Okay, so yeah, so we have a problem of um, of continuous uh, extension. We want to extend the, our function such that, uh, so yeah, because now we have a function that is not defined along this line, right? This, uh, maybe should maybe make it red instead. So, so this, uh, this straight line is outside the domain of this function. But uh, the question is, how, 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 do we extend, uh, how, how do we extend this function uh, in a way that uh, its extension will be a continuous function and it will be also defined where f is not defined? So, so the problem here is do we want to, we want to find a continuous function f tilde such that f tilde is continuous on R2 and f tilde of xy is equal to f of xy for all xy belonging to R2 minus this straight line. So this is the problem. And it might sound uh, qu quite complicated, uh, but, but it's, uh, it's only a matter of, uh, you know, removable singularities or find out if some limit exists. Um, yes, so first of all, you might notice that uh, the expression, um, x to the power of 3 minus y to the power of 3 divided by x minus y, you can factorize what's uh, what the, the, the numerator and you get x minus y times this divided by x minus y and then you just simplify these two guys. So the resulting thing is this object here, th this expression x squared plus x 
times y plus x uh, y times to the power of 2. OK, so now uh, what happens if we, so this, uh, what if, if I compute this limit? So what happens if I, uh, this, uh, this is improper, so I'll put uh, quotation marks here. But what, what happens if I say, well, x has to be very, very close to y in this expression. Uh, so this is going to be 3 times y squared, right? So and this will be the, the, our extension. So because because this singularity is removable in some sense, we, we could get rid. And then once you remove the singularity, you can see that uh, uh, you can see that this limit that I put on quotation mark exists. In, uh, so our resulting function f tilde will be f of x. Uh, for x belonging to, to this set and 3y uh, this for x equal to y. So this, are, this is our function. This function is continuous because it has been constructed to be so, because the limit exists and uh, it is defined in the whole plane. So, um, so this is our continuous extension. OK. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, in the limit, is it yes. x going to y? Yes, so that, that's, uh, that's uh, quite, I, in, yes, that, that's true. It's, uh, it's uh, quite improper to write uh, x that goes to y because, uh, I mean, mm, sorry. I. I have a problem with this f i pen. OK, this should be. So it's not really x that goes to y. It's some, it, it is more a way to indicate that uh, I want x and y to be close to be, to be the same, right? Uh, that's why I put quotation marks on the limits. It's not a real limit, but um, it's just to give the intuition of what is going on. OK, thanks. You can, you can think that you just fix some y. You just say, OK. I'll fix a y, and this y is equal, I don't know, to 5. And then I, I let x to go to 5. And then I change the, the value of y, and I'll set it to pi. And then I, I let the limit uh, of x to go to pi. And I repeat this process infinitely many times for all the, the real value of y. And that's what I mean, essentially. So um, you will always get uh, the value of y time, uh, to the power of 2 times uh, 3. That's, uh, that's the point. So. OK, other questions? OK. Let's see uh, the number 15, then. I'll change page. All right, so we, we do have a function uh, f of x, y here, uh, x minus y divided by x squared minus y squared. And we have a bunch of questions to answer to. So first of all, number one, compute the domain, no, not like this, compute the domain of f, right? So the domain of f is nothing but uh, sorry again. I got some strange. What is this? Sorry, there is. I oh, know that's something that doesn't. Okay, sorry, I got some strange, strange uh, email. So. Uh, okay, so so the domain is the set of the points where the denominator the, the denominator is uh, different from zero. So, um, yeah, so it's a set of the points 
belonging to R2 such that this is non zero. That's all. Uh, then we have another question. So, does limit for x, comma y that goes to 1, 1 of f of x exist? What is the answer here? Um, of course, this function can be um, okay. So x minus y divided by this is equal to these are different two squares, right? So you can actually simplify this expression, and this leads us to say that. Actually, the limb does exist, and it is equal to the limb for x comma y of this, and it is equal to one half. So yes, the limb, the limit does exist, and it is equal to one half. Um, all right. So then there is another question. And this question is um, can function can f be extended by continuity at one one at one one and the answer is yes. Uh, so by setting f tilde of one one to be equal to one half uh, in the same fashion as before. Okay. And the last question is can f be extended in the whole plane? Can f be can f be extended by continuity um, everywhere in the whole R2 plane? What do you think the an is the answer of this question? Can we do that? I'll go back and show you again that. No one wants to to try to. Why yes? Yes, exactly. Not at y equal to minus x. That's the answer. So yeah, so the, the, the whole analysis, <clears throat> the whole analysis that we have done so far with this removable singularity is telling us essentially that uh, it's okay if we extend our function along the line x equal to y because the singularity is removable, but in the end we end up with one divided by x plus y, which is which is an essential singularity. We can't really get rid of that. I mean, there are no more algebraic simplification that we can do. So yeah, so the answer is no. No, we can't. Because uh, the singularities on x equal to minus y are essentials. Essential. Let me let me write like this. So you can't remove them anymore by manipulating the algebraic expression of, of the fun function. And you can try yourself. You just take, uh, uh, try to compute the limit of that thing uh, to for x that goes to 1 and y goes to minus 1. You get that it is simply, blow, simply blows up and there is no way to, to make it work. So 
I want okay so yeah so the answer is no well, you you might want you might be interested to what happens to x to the origin but still at the origin it blows up because you have one divided by zero so uh, you have explosion you have uh, something yeah all right let's see what is left for today this is done this is done Okay, so there is uh, what we what was the number of this one? Fifteen. Okay. Okay, so before I start with the number twenty, which will likely be the last uh, exercise that I do today, I want to challenge you with um, so challenge for you. Some challenge. Challenging exercise. To show that the limit for x comma y that goes to zero zero of x squared y to the power of six divided by x to the power of six plus y to the power of eight is equal to zero. So try to solve this problem. Is it, this is a good exercise to see uh, to play with? It's probably harder to. I mean, it's not something immediate, so this is left for you. I will maybe solve it sometimes, but uh, maybe not. Okay, so we go back to our number 20. And we want to answer to this question. Um, and the question is, can 